Shall we pray as we come to read from God's word? Um, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the saviour of the world. We needed rescuing and you in power and in love came to earth to save us from our sins and from death. And, and Lord Jesus, we just want to praise you. We're so grateful for all you have done for us. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is with us and in our midst, moving in power as we speak. But Holy Spirit, we just ask you to, to speak to our hearts during this time. May, may words on a page not just be words on a page, but be words that, that, as Chris has prayed, impact our hearts, impact our minds, speak to us, change us, make us more Christ-like. Reveal the truth of the Christmas message to us this morning, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, have your will, do, have your way, and do your will amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Why do Christians celebrate Christmas? Why is it such an important time of year? Behind the lights and the presents and the food, what is it that is really, really important about Christmas to Christians, believers in Jesus Christ? Well, to answer that question, Luke introduces us to a couple called Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1. And um, Zechariah and Elizabeth are an old couple. Elizabeth is described as old and barren, but they are a holy, righteous couple. They are believers in God, and they trust in God. And God does an amazing miracle in their lives. An angel visits Zechariah and says, Elizabeth is going to bear a son. Zechariah is stunned at this news, shocked at the news he is hearing. And not just any son, this son to be born would be John the Baptist, who came as a witness to Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist came first, preaching the gospel, and Jesus followed after the saviour of the world. But Zech Zechariah is, is disbelieving, and so the angel strikes Zechariah dumb. And so for nine months, between receiving this news from the angel until the birth of John the Baptist, this man, Zechariah, cannot speak. He can only gesture and mime, and presumably when Christmas Day came around, the game of charades, he absolutely dominated, and because he'd had so much practice for nine months. Until finally, John the Baptist is born, and Zechariah's tongue is loosed and he is able to speak. And the verses we're going to read this morning are what, is what he says. After nine months of silence, I wonder what you would say. Well, this is what Zechariah says. At the birth of his own son. So I'm going to read to you Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 79. And I think as he speaks, he reveals why Christmas is so, so important for us as Christians. So Luke chapter 1 verses 67 to 79. And his father, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. These verses encapsulate the true wonder of Christmas. We've been doing our sermon series called The Songs of Advent, and last week we looked at Mary's song, and this week we look at Zechariah's song, his prophetic word. And I want us to look at these verses closely 
and understand why we love Christmas. Why do we celebrate it? Why do we enjoy it? Why is it so important to us as Christians? Now, the first thing I want you to see in those verses is that God acts. God acts. In three different ways, in verses 68 to 69, God acts in the lives of the nation of Israel. You'll see that God visits, God redeems, and God raises up a horn of salvation in those first two verses of Zechariah's prophecy. And so the first thing I want to say this morning is that Christmas is a celebration of what God has done. It's not a celebration of what we have done, or who we are, or what we're doing. It's first and foremost a celebration of what God has done. In Zechariah's prophecy, it's God who has been active. It's God who has moved. And he's acted in those three ways. He visits, he redeems, and he raises up a horn of salvation. So firstly, look at verse 68, where it says, God has visited his people. God has visited his people his people. Zechariah, of, of course, is talking about the baby Jesus. He's speaking in the past tense, even though Jesus is yet to be born, and yet he's so certain of God visiting that he can speak in the past te tense. And he says of the baby Jesus, he has visited his people. He's talking about the incarnation, is the Christian word we use, the theological term. Carne means flesh, and in means in. And so the incarnation is God in flesh coming into the world. God himself being born in human flesh. God the Son, Jesus Christ coming to earth as a human. God visiting his people in that completely real way, in that humble, relatable and wonderful way in Jesus being born a human being. Isn't that amazing just to reflect on just briefly? God being born a man in the baby of Jesus Christ. Verse 78 also describes the incarnation, but in a more poetic way. Verse 78 says, Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. The sunrise in that verse is Jesus himself. He is the sunrise, and he visits from on high because he's come from heaven down to earth to rescue his people. And when Jesus comes, it's like the sun rising and light shining in the darkness. All of humanity have lived in a darkness. They've lived, in fact, under the shadow of death. Death casts a shadow over all of humanity and over the whole nation of Israel. But when Jesus comes, it's like those first beams of the sunrise creeping over the horizon and shining into the darkness in which we have lived. It's an amazing moment for God himself being born in these first glimpses of light as the sun rises in the person of Jesus Christ. And so from this, from this verse about the sunrise, I want to bring a warning and an encouragement. My warning is don't trust in false dawns. Don't trust in false dawns. Vaccinations, the end of lockdown, Christmas celebrations and five days with your family, or, or, or pay rises, or great relationships are nice things, are good things, are wonderful things, but they are not the dawn that is going to break the darkness in your life. They are false dawns in that sense. They're nice things, they're wonderful things, but they are not going to defeat the darkness in your life and in this world. There is only one true light and one true dawn who can defeat darkness in your life. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the sunrise that comes over the horizon. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the one who defeats our greatest enemies and greatest foes. He is the true dawn. And when he comes that first Christmas time, it is like the sunrise has come. In Luke 7, verse 16, so a few chapters later in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus Christ 
raises a boy from the dead. And the crowds who see this amazing miracle are astonished. A great shout goes up. Some of them shout, a great prophet has arisen when they see what Jesus has done. But others realise the truth. They see Jesus raising a boy from the dead and they say, God has visited his people. God has visited his people. And so Zechariah doesn't just prophesy it in Luke chapter 1, but Jesus demonstrates that he is God in flesh by his amazing miracles in raising a boy to life. That's the first thing that God has done. It's the first thing we celebrate every Christmas, that God has visited his people in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the sunrise in the darkness. And that is something worth celebrating. The second thing, the second way God acts in those verses is that God redeems his people in verse 68. Jesus doesn't just visit the people. Jesus doesn't come to earth for like a holiday, like to have, I don't know, to to catch some rays of sun um, in Jerusalem or, or in Bethlehem. Jesus doesn't come for a flying visit. He doesn't come just to enjoy himself. No, he comes on a mission and his mission is redemption. His mission is to redeem his people. Now that word redemption, that word redeem, means the payment of a full ransom price to free a slave. If you wanted to free a slave, a slave owner had a slave, and you wanted to free that slave, you would pay the full price to the slave owner, and therefore the the slave would be freed to go free. And in Christianity, we use that word redeem, we use that word ransom price to say this, Jesus paid the ransom price, he paid the debt owed by dying on the cross. Jesus paid the penalty for sin. There is a a consequence for sin, there is a debt caused by sin, Jesus paid it on the cross. He paid the full ransom price. And therefore, all who have faith in Jesus Christ can live in the freedom that Jesus has bought for us, the freedom that Jesus has won upon the cross. It's a freedom brought about by forgiveness. We're no longer shackled by guilt and sin, but we are forgiven and therefore free. Even at Jesus' birth, even before Jesus' birth, Zechariah is prophesying about Jesus' death. He's saying God has visited his people and God has redeemed his people. And he is prophesying about the moment where Jesus dies on the cross, pays the price for sin that all who would believe in him can be freed. Every single person in history has lived as a slave in some sense to sin. They have internal desires that rule over them and therefore they do things that they ultimately don't want to do. We, we can, you can tell this about yourself by the way you treat the people you love the most. You do things, you say things, you act in a way that you would not want to act to the people you love the most. You hurt them sometimes with the things that you say. And that's sin rearing its head in your life, causing, in, in a sense, to do things that you don't want to do. It, it, it's because you're shackled by those desires. You're shackled by sin. Jesus comes, dies on the cross, defeats sin, defeats death in his resurrection so that shackles are broken and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, given new life and new birth, such that we are freed to live free from the power of sin. That doesn't mean that we instantly become perfect, but we have been freed by Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. So God visits, God redeems, and thirdly, Zechariah can say God has not only visited and redeemed, he has also raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. Verse 69. The horn of a goat or a ram or a bull was a symbol of strength and power. They used their horns to, to battle and fight. Um, I don't think I've ever seen that on any of document, nature documentaries, but maybe you have. You've seen rams kind of butting heads against each other with their horns. They're, so the horns are a Hebraic Jewish symbol of strength and power. And so what Zechariah is saying is in Jesus, the power, the strength of salvation has come. 
He is the horn of salvation that God has raised up. Do you want to know how to be saved? Do you want to know where the power for salvation comes from? It's in and through Jesus Christ, God who has visited and redeemed his people. This is a, this is a fundamental Christian belief. You do not earn your own salvation by your own strength or power. It's not your strength. It's not your power that is going to save you. Other religions say things like this. You need to live better to be saved. You need to do good things in order to be saved. But you can resolve to be good. And in your resolution to be good, you can rescue yourself. You have strength enough. You have power enough. Christianity doesn't say that. Christianity doesn't say that. Christianity says... You're weak, and you've done things wrong. You're a sinner. You need a saviour. You need someone else to come with the strength and power for salvation in order to rescue rescue you. That's the start of the Christian message is we need a saviour. And then this is the good news. This is the gospel we believe. God has raised up a horn of salvation in Jesus. God has raised up the power to be saved in Christ. The sunrise has risen in the darkness. The horn of salvation has come. God visits his people. God redeems his people. God saves his people. That is why Christians celebrate Christmas. It's all about what God has done. And so I I say to you, if you're a Christian this morning, may there be joy in your heart. We've sung about joy this morning, haven't we? May there be joy in your heart that God visited, that God redeemed, and that God saves. And if you're not a Christian, as we prayed earlier, we pray that God would give you that joy, that you would understand and receive the gift of Jesus Christ, God visiting, redeeming, and saving his people. So there's three actions in Zechariah's prophecy. There's also two purposes, three actions from God and then two purposes, reasons why God has acted in this way. And the first purpose revealed in Zechariah's prophecy is that God has acted this way to fulfill his promises. God visits, God redeems, God raises up a horn of salvation because he promised that he would. Look at verse 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Or look at verse 72. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. Jesus' birth isn't just an isolated moment of history. It's a moment that has been anticipated and expected for generations and generations in the nation of Israel. The Jewish people have been looking for a Messiah to come, a saviour to come. It's a moment that has been promised and foretold over and over again in the Old Testament. It's one of the primary reasons I'm a Christian, actually, is because I read the Old Testament and I say, this is amazing. These are texts that's written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, and yet they foretell of, of Jesus Christ, of his life and his death and his resurrection. This is, this is another biblical principle we can draw out from Zechariah's prophecy. The Lord reveals his plans by speaking beforehand. I haven't noted down the reference, actually, but I think it's a verse from the book of Amos that that says God speaks to his prophets before he moves and acts. This is how God has acted in history. He communicates with his children. He speaks to prophets who speak on behalf of God and say, this is how God is going to act. This is what God is going to do. We, we know this personally as a church, actually. We had lots of prophetic words about who we would be as a church and what God would do through us. And at the time, those words sounded silly. There was nine adults who planted this church thinking, how is this, how are we going to establish a church? This is madness to start a church with nine adults. And I remember some of those Sundays preaching to so few people thinking, wow, is this church or is this me just having like a, I don't know, just having fun in front of a few mates? Like, but we, so we had all these prophetic words. God spoke to us. And God is fulfilling those prophetic words in our midst as we grow, as we see people's lives impact. This is how God chooses to act. He speaks to his children. He speaks to his people and then he moves in power. There's a second thing, a second principle we can draw from this as well. 
which is deeply, deeply encouraging to me. God's promises never fail. That which he has spoken hundreds, thousands of years before comes to pass. God's promises, God's words never fail. We love the promises of God because he always delivers. That's why we love the Bible and we love God's word and we read God's word and we, 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 we take our time and we seek to understand it because in this book is contained the glorious and wonderful promises of God and they're not just words. They are things that will come to pass or have already come to pass. When God speaks, his promises never fail. I just want to meditate on one promise. There are so many promises in the Bible, but one that I've been thinking of and links to this passage is in John 8 verse 12. Jesus says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a promise from Jesus Christ. That's a promise from God that will not fail. If you follow Jesus, if you trust in him, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Isn't that something that we all want? More light, more life in our life. Let's, let's believe that promise from Jesus Christ that if we follow him, we have it already. So that's God's first purpose. God has acted in this way in, because he promised that he would and his promise to never fail. He always delivers on the words he says. Now the second purpose revealed by Zechariah's prophecy is the second purpose, the second reason God acts in this way is that we should be saved. Look at verse 71. Zechariah says that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And then in verse 74, Zechariah says that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies. He goes on to say, so he says we're saved from the hand of our enemies in verse 74, and he says we're saved into serving God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And so the reason God has acted in history in, is in order that he might save his people, in order that he might save his children, in order that he might save all who trust in Jesus. Every single Christian, God has moved this way in order to save them. Now the question is, who are the enemies that Zechariah is speaking about in this prophecy? It's possible that he was thinking about Rome and King Herod, and the political rulers and leaders who, who had invaded and conquered Israel. And so he's thinking about Israel being politically freed from their enemies. But look carefully at verse 77. In verse 77, Zechariah is speaking to his son, John the, John the Baptist. And he says, John the Baptist is called to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of of their sins. So you, if you read that verse very, very carefully, you see that salvation is in or by forgiveness of sins. That's, that's where the salvation is. It's in the forgiveness of sins. Not in a mighty warlord defeating Herod and Rome with a flaming sword and coming and conquering the Roman Empire and delivering Israel in that way, but rather in the forgiveness of sins. And so I think Zechariah is speaking very insightfully, prophetically by the Holy Spirit here. And he is understanding that our greatest enemies are not flesh and blood. The Israelites' greatest enemies was not King Herod, was not the Roman Empire. Rather, what Zechariah understands is that our greatest enemies are sin and death and Satan who hates us and wants us all to perish and die in sin. Those are the enemies that Zechariah is speaking about. Otherwise, forgiveness of sin wouldn't be a way salvation could be offered. It's only if those are the enemies that Zechariah is speaking of that forgiveness of sin is a powerful weapon. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56 says, The sting of death is sin. By sin death was brought into the world. If you read the, the stories of the book of Genesis, it's when Adam and Eve disobey God, it's when they sin that they bring death, spiritual death, into the world. And so we believe, according to that verse, that without sin, death can do nothing. 
death is powerful. If you, if you take a bee and you rip off its sting, I think the bee dies, I'm not a biologist, but at, at the very least, the bee can no longer sting you or do you any harm. And so it's the same with death. If you, if you take death and you rip off the sting that is sin, Death is suddenly powerless and harmless to you. It can do you no wrong. And so when you take away sin, death loses its power over your life. Without sin, death can do nothing. And so all who are granted forgiveness of sin are delivered from death. They are delivered from those old foes, sin, death, and Satan, whose schemes are thwarted. That Satan, Satan's scheme is, is that you would be a sinner, that you would not believe in Jesus Christ, and therefore, because you are a sinner, death would have its sting and would sting you, and you, and you, would, you would perish in your sin. That's what Satan's hoping. Take away sin, bring forgiveness of sin, death's power's gone, Satan's power is also defeated. Isn't this amazing? Jesus dies on the cross so that all who believe in Christ have forgiveness of sin. And in that moment when Jesus dies, he defeats the power of death. And we often talk about Jesus' resurrection being the moment he defeated death. And that's true as well. Death could not hold him. He rose from the grave in power. But it was also on the cross when he granted forgiveness of sin that he took away the sting of death so that death could not hurt those who trust in Jesus Christ. This is a glorious purpose of God, to rescue us, to save us from sin and from death and from Satan. This is a reason to rejoice this Christmas time. So we have three actions of God, we have two purposes of God, and we have one task that we are given by God. Are you proud of me for three, two, one? Isn't that beautiful? I was so, so brilliant. Um, I don't often do little cheesy things like that, but I was quite pleased with myself when I was writing this one. Sorry for my pride, Lord God, forgive me. Three actions, two purposes, and one task. Look at verse 76. Now remember, Zechariah is speaking at the birth of his son. His son John has just been born in this moment. He spent the first half of his song talking only about God, talking only about Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? This is what the Holy Spirit does. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and people prophesy, you speak about God, you speak about Jesus and what he has done. And, and yes, he comes on to speak about John the Baptist, but it's just so amazing what God is doing in Jesus Christ. I think it's an amazing testimony to the way the Holy Spirit focuses our attention on Christ, on his power, on his love, on his salvation. That even at the birth of his son, Zechariah speaks predominantly about Jesus. And only at the end of his prophecy comes to speak about John the Baptist. So, John, so Zechariah speaks to John. He says in verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. John's task in verses 76 and 77 was to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ by giving knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of sin. What was John the Baptist going to do? He was going to go into the wilderness. He was going to baptise people. And as he was baptising people, he's preaching this message of salvation. One who is coming after me, Jesus Christ, is able to bring forgiveness of sin. He's able to baptise you in the Holy Spirit. And this, sim this symbolic moment where I, I dunk you in the water and then raise you back up is a washing away of your sin. It's a message of forgiveness that John the Baptist was preaching. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he was declaring. That was John's mission. That was the task that was given to John the Baptist by God and by his father, Zechariah, in this prophecy. It is also our task. It is also our task to teach people about the salvation on offer in Jesus Christ. To tell people there is forgiveness of sin that can bring light in their darkness, can bring forgiveness, can bring a freedom from guilt, a freedom from shame, can, can bring people away from death into eternal life. That's our task. That's the task that we are given to teach people about salvation. Now I want to say this. I am not the minister of this church. You are. The whole church are ministers according to the Bible. In Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12, it says that Jesus gave leaders to the church in order to equip the saints for works of ministry. 
the saint. That's you guys. That's, that's the Christian. If you're a Christian, you are a saint, and so you are to be equipped for works of ministry. You are a minister if you're a saint. If you're a Christian, you're a saint, and if you're a saint, you're a minister. And so when I say our task is to give knowledge of salvation, what I'm not hoping for is that we would all just sit and listen to someone preach every Sunday and we go, well, the preacher is bringing knowledge of salvation, so our task is done. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is us going out into the world building relationships with people, loving people, showing the love of Christ, showing the light of Christ, and then ministering to people by giving knowledge of salvation. Yes, we do it on a Sunday, and yes, there's a great opportunity to invite people to to hear what we are preaching and what we're proclaiming, that they might have knowledge of salvation. But I think the impact and the message of this text and of Ephesians 4 is that each of us would be ministering to the people we know. Each of us would be sharing knowledge of salvation with the people we know. Sunday morning should not be the primary place of proclamation. It should be a place of equipping in which we are equipped to proclaim, to give knowledge of salvation outside these walls. And so I'm going to ask you a negative question, and then I'm going to phrase the question more positively. My negative question is, when was the last time you gave knowledge of salvation to somebody else? When was the last time? That's a convicting question. That's a challenging question. It's difficult to be evangelist. We need to be bold as Christians. We need to have faith and great love. So I appreciate that that is a challenging question. But, but if it's a long time ago, then, then I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you through this text and challenging you. Now let me um, phrase the question more positively. Who can you teach about salvation today or this week? Who are you going to speak to? Who have you got a close relationship with? Who do you love and really want to see believe in Jesus Christ? Whom can you teach knowledge of salvation to in the week ahead? Even today, this afternoon, I would encourage you not to, not to just let this sermon just be something that you listen to, but rather something that you try and put into practice by teaching knowledge of salvation, just like John the Baptist did. I mean, not just like John the Baptist did, because he went out into the wilderness and he, and he wore camel hair and so on and so forth. I'm not expecting us to do that and eat locusts. But just as John the Baptist was sharing knowledge of salvation, we too are ministers. How can we share knowledge of salvation with those around you? Let's look back on our failure to fulfill this task and ask God for forgiveness. He's the God of tender mercy, according to Zechariah in this prophecy. He forgives us. Now let's look forward to how we can accept and live out this task given to us. Can we share the video of this service when it's uploaded later on today? That's an easy way of of fulfilling this task. That's an easy thing we can do. Can we pick up the phone and ring someone and share with them knowledge of salvation? Can we write them an email? Can we write them a Facebook message? There's plenty of ways we can contact people and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is the task that God has given to us. I'm not not satisfied with, with the people whom we love who are at home watching and the people in this room. I'm not satisfied because there are thousands of people in this town who do not know Jesus, who do not know forgiveness of sins, who are living in the chains of sin, who need to be freed into the glorious joy which we have as Christians. And so I want this room to be packed and for us to have huge social distancing issues in a sense. I want this room to be packed of people who longing to meet with Jesus Christ because they have understood the gospel, the good news that we believe as Christians, that there is forgiveness for all who trust in Jesus. And in my experience, people respect authenticity and genuine concern. I I I appreciate that for some of you this is hard, but I've had conversations that go a bit like this, and generally the responses I've got have not necessarily been, yes, I want to believe in Christ immediately, but they have been respectful responses and people have listened to me. So I've, com- I've had conversations where I've ever written this down or I've said something like this to someone. Hey, mate, I know you aren't a Christian and you might not agree with what I believe, but it's my duty. In fact, it's more than my duty. It's my way of sharing that I have concern for you, that I care for you as my friend to tell you about the salvation on offer in Christianity, to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. 
I've used something very similar to that in conversations with people. And people will listen. If you can pick up the phone and say, hey, I want to tell you something that's really important to me. I know you might not agree with it, but will you just listen to me because I care about you. And so I have to share this because I care about you. They will listen. I think they will listen. And might be one or two people who slam down the phone and say, leave me alone, got no interest. But I think in general, if you've built up a relationship, if you love someone and they are a friend to you or a family member to you, they will listen. Now, I have it easy. I, I planted a church, and that opens up all kinds of doors of opportunity to, sh to share the gospel. So I, I'm saying in some ways I have it easy because they go, what do you do? I'm a church pastor. Oh, that's interesting. And suddenly there's a, there's a topic being opened up in which I can say something about Jesus. You guys have it harder. I appreciate that. You do amazing jobs. You honour and serve the Lord in your secular jobs. So it's going to take real faith for you to live this out. It's going to take real love for, for, for your fellow man for you to live this out. It's, I'm not saying it's easy, but I believe with the Holy Spirit within us, prompting us and guiding us, and with a boldness and faith in God, we can step out and begin, maybe for the first time, or maybe once again, maybe it's something that we've stopped doing that we used to do, or maybe it's something that we've always been good at, but we need to grow in it and get even better at it. I want to see a church of people who boldly and lovingly are speaking the knowledge of salvation into the lives of the people around you. Christmas is an opportunity that we should not miss. Everyone's, nearly everyone is interested in Christmas. And that's kind of a door that you can open into sharing the gospel. And I think if we do it genuinely and in a heartfelt way, we're going to see people listen. And you know, once people have listened and you've, you've spoken it, you've done your bit. You've done your bit. God will do the rest. It's God who saves people. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms lives. It's not your job. So if you've done your bit, if you've said something about the goodness of Christ, if you said something about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, you're done. All you need to do is pray and hope that that seed would grow into the fruit of faith in that person's life. And so I do think that this is a, a sermon of conviction and challenge. I also think it's a sermon of joy. Three actions of God in Zechariah's prophecy. He has visited his people in the person of Christ. He has redeemed his people in the person of Christ. He has raised up a horn of salvation in Christ to rescue us. He has two purposes, to fulfill his promises, his promises never fail, and to rescue us from our enemies into a life of serving God without fear in holiness and righteousness in order that we might take up this task to prepare the way of Jesus by giving knowledge of salvation to our friends and family members who do not know him. Let's, um, let's pray together. I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, we thank you so much for Christmas. We thank you for the actions that you, God, have taken. You have visited us in Jesus Christ. It's amazing to reflect on God being born in human flesh in Jesus Christ. You have redeemed us through the cross. We have been rescued. All who trust in Christ have been rescued by Jesus' death upon the cross and resurrection from the dead. And you have raised up a horn of salvation, the power of salvation for us in Jesus. We are so grateful, and I pray this Christmas we would rejoice in those three amazing actions you have performed, Lord God. We thank you that your promises never fail, and we thank you that you acted in that way in order to save us from the, our old foes of sin and death and into a life of serving you, the King of light and of life. Lord, I pray that you would give us a boldness now. You would give us a confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit and a confidence in the good news of Christ that is the power of salvation to those who believe it, that we might boldly proclaim and give knowledge to others of this amazing salvation we have received. I pray we would do it gently and wisely and lovingly, but we would not shrink back. I pray that every single person in Christ Church Fairham would know they are a minister. They have been empowered. They have been appointed. They have been called to evangelize and share the gospel. May we live this out, that the many people who do not know Jesus would hear the good news of Christ. And we pray you would move in power to save many into your kingdom, into your family, that many would prophesy like Zechariah, that many would rejoice in Christmas, not because of all the the superficial things, 
but because of the real thing that we celebrate, the birth of Jesus Christ, the moment when God became a man. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your word, Lord God. May we live for you. In Jesus' name.